Well, my name is Jordan. I'm the small groups pastor here at Two Rivers Church. And it's my privilege and honor to be able to share the word with you today. So this morning, I want you to just picture this. This morning I wake up because my dog is just panicking. Like, it's like that panic when they have to go to the bathroom. And sometimes I feel really bad for dogs because I think about, like, if I had to go to the bathroom really bad but I couldn't talk how, and I couldn't go to the bathroom, it would just be horrible. So my dog's freaking out. And so I go and I let my dog out. I'm half asleep. And it's like 20 minutes before my alarm went off, so I'm a little frustrated. And I walk into my bathroom, and all of a sudden a bee just flies and hits me right in the face. I'm like, what? Why is there a bee in my bathroom? And so I'm freaking out. I'm half asleep. I'm like, how am I going to kill this bee? And I look over on the counter, and I see it. My weapon of choice, a Febreze can. Pumpkin spice Febreze. I'm like, you're going down. You're going down, B. So I'm spraying it. I'm getting it. And it's finally, it like lands and it's rolling around in the dust. And then I grab it and kill it. And that was my introduction to the fall. Not pumpkin spice lattes. Pumpkin spice Febreze. Come on now. Well, today I have the opportunity to preach to you about who's your five. Who are your five? Fitting as a small group's pastor to, to have you think about, I want you to think about right now, who are the people in your life that are closest to you? Who are your closest friends, closest family members, the people you spend the most time with? Maybe it's five, maybe it's two, maybe, it's, maybe you're super popular and you have ten people that are in your life on a weekly basis. I want you to take a moment, I want you to think about who those people are. Many sociologists say that we are the sum of the five closest people in our life. Basically what that means is the people that are, we're spending the most time with are the people that are going to influence us most and help shape the character and who we are. But it goes both ways that you also have the opportunity to influence other people, to be the one influencing other people. When I think about my five, it's kind of changed over the years. And when I say five, it can be any number. It's just five, okay, five. When I think about my five, it's kind of changed over the years. When I was in youth group in middle school and high school, I had five, my five was my youth group. Going to, I had a small group that we would, we would have worship and a word, and then afterwards we'd break up into little groups in the church. And I remember in seventh grade, I got placed into this small group, and I was with that same group of friends in seventh grade all the way through to our senior year. And it was incredible because it helped shape who I was and changed the trajectory of my life, I truly believe, because of these people. I remember I went on mission trips with these friends. We went to Jamaica as a youth group. We went to Nicaragua as a youth group on mission trips. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit with these group of friends. I was, uh, I was honestly, I feel like saved as a 13-year-old going on a youth retreat in Cleveland, Ohio with these group of friends. Year five matters. That's my point number one. My five in college kind of changed a little bit. My five in college changed a bit. I, I had a few friends that were doing great things and loved the Lord and loved being a part of the church and community and, and inspired me to, to move in that direction. But I had a few other friends that I made in college that were not living that life, weren't very interested in church. And I felt when I was in college this tug in both directions. Your five matters. Now as a husband, a father, my five has changed once again. But now I'm, I'm much more intentional about who are my community, who is my closest friends. I'm be honest with you, there's times when Bella and I have gotten out of our car or wa walked out to our car after hanging out with somebody and we're like, wow, being around that, those people was incredible. We feel so inspired. I, it's those kind of people, I'm sure you have them too, where you're just like, I just want to be with them. I don't care what we do. I feel encouraged when I'm with that person. And I just want to love Jesus more because I spent an hour with that person over coffee. But then we'll get in our car sometimes and we're like, ugh. They, they're great, but they're, we're not 
that we don't feel like they're pushing us in the right direction. I don't know if we can have those people as our closest people in our life. I think it's important that each and every one of us think about this because it's forming us and it's pushing us in a certain direction. Now, I just want to be clear. What I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you should just cut people out of your life. That is not what I'm saying. God has called us to be salt and light. You're called to make an influence on people's lives. And there's people that you're, you need to be a part of their life and speak into them and encourage them. But I heard someone say to me once, uh, when I was struggling with this when I was in college, my young adult leader said to me this, there's some people that you are supposed to speak into, but you are never to allow them to speak into you. You're never allow, you should never allow them to, don't go to them for advice, don't share your problems with them, because their point of view is not the one that you, is going to lead you closer to Jesus. It's not the one that's going to make you a better husband. It's not the one that's going to make you a better wife, a better parent. You need to think about who your five is. I love Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's an old, dead theologian. So, some of my friends, they, they only read books, they say, by uh, ODGs. Old, dead guys. They only read books by people that are dead, Christian books, because their thought is like, this person finished their race well, and so I want to hear what they have to say. Well, Charles Spurgeon finished the race well, and he was kind of hardcore, and he kind of sounds mean, but I love this quote when he's talking about friendships, and it's a little harsh, but it's important that we take it to heart. He says this about who our friends should be. They need to be strong, for the burden is heavy. They need to be resolute, for their work will try their faith. They need to be prayerful, for otherwise they labor in vain. They must be believing, or they will be utterly useless. Our five matters. Our five matters. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for today. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be a part of community. I thank you for small group leaders in this church that are making a difference and are, have a faith to see people's lives transformed. I pray for this word today, that it will be your words and not mine. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, well, turn in your, uh, into your phones to Luke chapter 5. And turn to your Bibles, Luke chapter 5. Verse 17 to 26. I got to be honest, I use my phone as a Bible. I have like four different Bible apps, and each one I use it for something different, and I think it's really useful. So hold up your phone. I'm just kidding. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 to 26. I'm reading in the NLT. It says this. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. Those religious Pharisees. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem. And this next line is important. And the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Verse 18. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. I want you to really picture this, okay? So men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Can I just stop right there? If someone went up on my roof and took off some tiles... I wouldn't describe what they were doing as going up on my roof and taking off tiles. I would say, get off my roof, you're breaking in. They were full on breaking into this guy's house, okay? These are some good friends. So they went up to the roof, took off some tiles, then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? 
I love that because he's already prepping their hearts for the miracle that's going to take place. Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? Verse 24, so I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Immediately as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. Come on, somebody. I want to see, I want to hear about amazing things that are taking place in small group. Come on now. It's not just about a gathering. It's not just about a time to come together. I know we said we got good food. I love that small group has good food. It should have good food. When I was in college, I know I said this already, but I was so poor in college, I would literally find out about all the different small groups and go to them throughout the week just so I could get something to eat. I don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> but that's what I did. Picture these friends. Do you have friends like this? I, they picked this man up on a sleeping mat, it said. And they're all, ta- they're all holding a corner and they're carrying them. They get to the house that Jesus was preaching at, and it was full. Now, in my mind, if I was one of these friends, I wouldn't just immediately be like, oh, guys, I've got a good idea. Let's go up on the roof, break through it, and then lower this paralyzed man down with ropes right in front of uh, Pastor Will as he's preaching. That would be absurd. I wouldn't, I would not, that would not be the first thought that would come to my mind. I'd think, let's go to the windows Let's go maybe to the back door and see if that's unlocked. But these friends had grit. These friends cared about the trajectory of their friend's life. Your five matters. Your five matters. Now, just as important as it is to have a good group of friends, it's also important that we carry our own responsibilities as well. My second point is this, pick up your mat. When we read about this miracle story, the first thing that Jesus does is he first tells this man with no action necessary from him alone. But instead it was just based off of the action of his friends. He says, because of your friend's faith, your sins are forgiven. Wow. Have you thought about that before? Have you thought about the fact that your friends that are in your life could have an impact on your salvation? Or maybe, have you thought about the opposite? That because of your faith, because of your faith, come on small group leaders, because of your faith, you can have an impact on other people's salvation as well. But then, in verse 24, Jesus turns to the paralyzed man, and now he puts a responsibility on him. He says, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. At no point in the scripture does it say that the man is already healed. So Jesus hasn't prayed over him yet. The man is on the ground, on the mat, paralyzed, looking up at Jesus, and Jesus' words to him are, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Man, think about that. I I think about that in my life, things that I've struggled with throughout my life and things that I've had to navigate. And imagine going through something your entire life, whether that's a sickness or whatever it might be, a, a disability, and then someone telling you, because this this didn't know, he didn't know who Jesus was necessarily. Someone telling you, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. It took the faith of that man then to step up and take, the, and take that responsibility. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says this. We should carry each other's burdens. But then in verse 5 it says this. Each one should carry their own load. I share all this to say because in small group you're dealing with people. You're in relationship with people. And People have burdens. I've got burdens. 
I've got stuff I'm going through. All of us have stuff we're going through. And I was talking with a counselor about this one time, and she said this. She broke down this verse for me, and she said, in verse 2, when it says that we should carry each other's burdens, she said, picture a boulder. And the boulder is too heavy for only one person to carry. And maybe you're thinking right now of situations in your life, and you're like, wow, Pastor Jordan, that's a boulder. There's no way that I can carry this on my own. That's what verse 2 was talking about. But verse 5 says, each one should carry their own load. And she said this about that. That this verse, this verse is almost talking like a backpack. That each of us have a backpack of responsibility in our life. It's things that, we, that God has specifically called for us to take care of. Or maybe it's even struggles that we're going through in our mind. And, and as I was thinking about this and praying about this, I started to think like, wow, God, you have done so much in my life to help mold me and help shape me through my backpack. You've taken some things out. You've put other things in. And to really drive this point home, I want to share a little story about myself that if I'm honest with you, I'm really uncomfortable sharing. Um, but I think it's important for us to be vulnerable. And in small group, vulnerability is the most important thing. And so I want to share a little bit about myself. And this, this thing is something that honestly is a, caused a great insecurity in my life. And when I was born, I had a stroke. And because it happened when I was born, um, I was never really able to go to rehab and fix this and uh, physical therapy to um, regain motor function the way I should have on my entire right side of my body. Can't move my fingers, can't move my hands the right way. And so, honestly, that it's been a huge insecurity in my life. I read stories in, in scripture like this in Luke chapter 5 of the paralyzed man who who gets carried and then gets saved and then uh, the next turn is just all of a sudden healed. And I, I have questioned God, if I'm honest with you, and said, God, why is this not happening in my life? And you know what, I think each and every one of us can relate to that. Things that we've prayed for and, and had to deal with. And, but can I tell you that because of the five that have been in my life, in youth group and the relationships that I've had that were able to speak into me and then in college and now as a husband and a father, the men and women in my life that have been able to help shape me and mold me and that God has used to speak into me, God wants to use your circumstance as a testimony. And sometimes it might look like, like mine where I'm still praying and believing. And let me tell you right now, it doesn't affect my faith. My circumstances, I don't align my faith with my circumstance. I align my faith with the scripture. And you know what I love is that after this man, at the end of this, it says, everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, we have seen amazing things today. You've got a testimony that other people need to see. And people see it worked out in small group. People see it worked out in relationship. And they see your testimony unfolding and unfolding. And with that, we have an incredible testimony that we're going to play on the screens of somebody who had stuff going on in their life. And they felt called to come to church. And their life has been completely transformed because of it. Let's check out the screens. My name's Danielle. I serve on the host team here at Two Rivers Church. I started coming to Two Rivers Church about six months ago, probably like the end of February. So I recognized that there was a few needs that I felt like I needed to come attend a church. Um, in June of 2023, I lost my brother to suicide. Um, so that was a huge impact on my life. Um, you never realize how much that stuff really affects you until something like that does happen to you. Um, and then two weeks later, I closed on my first house um, as a single mom at 27 years old. Um, so even in the dullest moments, there was light that was shined. Um, definitely just overwhelming, and I felt as if I had no other place to go. My first time here at Two Rivers, it was just so welcoming. Um, everyone just greeted you with a smile. You literally felt like you were at home. So it's like 
super comfortable to be here and I always explain it like I wish I could just sleep on the floor in the church to just be comfortable because uh, definitely a safe place here at Two Rivers. The moment I realized I wanted to be part of a small group, it was actually here at Next Steps. It was my first time attending Next Steps. Um, <clears throat> You kind of just go around and you tell a little bit about yourself and I started telling a little bit about myself and Pastor Will just mentioned small groups. Um, Pastor Jordan and his wife Bella were pretty much new here like the same time I started and they wanted to get a young adult small group started and it literally just played out perfectly. I've always heard about people joining groups whether it's at a church or just outside in the world. Um, it's nice to have a team of people that are there for you. I have gained so many friendships from just going to small group. It's very nice to have people that can gather that have a young children and also have chaotic lives because everyone's life is chaotic. And just knowing that everyone is praying for you and you're also praying for everyone else that's there, um, that's comforting to know that you have someone, a group of people to actually fall back on, not just a single person. I just feel more open and more comfortable speaking about it around that group of people than I would other people that have been in my life in the past. A support system that you never had and now that you do have it, you want other people to also feel that and be able to have the opportunity to have that. I've seen God move in so many ways since I've started. I used to have so much stress and anxiety within myself that I felt would never go away. Um, I always look forward to a small group each week. It was just so, such a relief to know that on Tuesdays at 6.45, we're gonna meet with small group and we're gonna speak about the Lord. We're gonna tell our stories and be there for one another. And it's always nice to have that group that can gather to do that. You literally just feel God's presence and that is what's so amazing. If you're on the fence about joining a small group, I would say to just take that leap of faith and actually join the small group. Uh, this is the church for non-perfect people and the small group is also the same. We love small groups. So. <laughs> amen, amen. Can we give it up for Danielle? Thank you so much for sharing that, Danielle, and sharing to the church. Like I said, our testimonies make a difference. And we've loved... I, I know it was the same Sunday. It was our first Sunday at Two Rivers Church, Bell and I. And we went down to Next Steps just to check it out. And that was Danielle's first Sunday also here at Two Rivers. And it was so cool. It's been so cool just to have her be a part of our small group and just to see her life transformed. And now what a testimony that now she is herself leading a small group with Hunter and making an impact on other people's lives. Because the gospel is not meant to just stay with us. The transformation that takes place in us, it's meant to go to someone else too and for other lives to be transformed. And we are meant to do this together. My last point is this. He grafts us all. He grafts us all in, even the outcasts. The worship team can come on back up, the keys, the Holy Spirit keys. Psychologists, they break down this mental, um, this mental pathway, and I thought it was applicable to this. They talk about depression, and they say that all depression really is, is it's internalized anger. It's anger, something that's happened in your life that's upsetting to you, that you don't have the opportunity or you haven't had the opportunity yet to take from the inside and put it out somewhere. And they talk about how if you don't have the opportunity to take your anger and the thing that hurt you and bring it to someone and say, hey, listen, I feel angry right now because of this hurt that happened in my life. If you don't have someone like that to go to and you just internalize it, they say that's the main root of what causes depression. It gets caught in this little, oh, sorry about that. It gets caught in this little chasm where it has no, just an opportunity to breed and grow. And they say that as that grows, anxiety kicks in. And as anxiety kicks in, panic starts to kick in. And as humans, we don't wanna feel that. So we look for our coping mechanisms. That's where drug and alcohol comes in, sex, pornography, 
all these coping mechanisms because we don't want to feel this anymore. But you know what that ultimately turns into? Shame. And then it turns into this cycle that, oh, I feel shame now, and I feel, why did I do this? And then you feel anger, which turns into hurt, which turns into depression again and anxiety, and then you go back to the addiction, and it's a cycle. I love that Eric shared about <coughs> our addiction and recovery group. If you're struggling, join a group. Because what psychologists say is that as if we have somebody that we can go to and they grab us and they pull us out of that, but you know what they do? If we have somebody that can start speaking into that hurt, into that specific hurt, speaking love, speaking encouragement. You know, last week we, we had our Blockbuster Sunday and it was uh, Inside Out 2. It was such a fun Sunday. I loved how Pastor Will turned that into an incredible sermon. And so I'm going to stick with the theme of Disney really quick. I don't know if you've seen the movie Soul, but there's a part of that movie where towards the end, I'm going to ruin the movie for you, but <laughs> there's a part where it's like it turns into like this depression, tornado, where they're just stuck and they need to be pulled out. In Luke chapter 5, we've been talking about the paralyzed man, but there's a theme in Luke chapter 5. A theme of the outcast. And maybe you're in this room today and you feel like an outcast. Maybe you're in this room today and I've been talking about your five and you haven't been able to think of anybody. Maybe you feel lonely. There's a theme in Luke chapter 5 and that's the outcast. It's the paralyzed man. There's the man that's healed of leprosy. And there's the disciple Matthew who was a tax collector. All three of these men in that time period would have been an outcast to the Jewish community. If you had leprosy, they completely kick you out of the community. Paralyzed, you were a beggar on the street. And a tax collector, you were seen as a robber that was only interested in lining their own pockets. But you know what I love? is that Jesus met all three of these men and he pulled them out. And this morning you might be feeling like you're isolated. You're looked over. You're an outcast. But there's no such thing in the kingdom of God. Jesus has set a table and he's put a plate down. He's put a cup down and he's reserved it for you and he says, welcome, son and daughter. Come and sit at the table with me. I've anointed you. I've called you. You're a son of mine. You're a daughter of mine. And today you might be dealing with addiction. You might be dealing with isolation. But, but it doesn't need to leave here today. It does not need to leave here today. It can be broken at the altar. Do you believe that? I want to talk to two groups really quick as I wrap up. My group number one is that you feel like you're in that tornado. That cycle of depression and anxiety and, and shame and guilt. That you feel like you are all by yourself. That you can never get out of this. And I want to tell you today that you can be set free. And with every eye bowed, or sorry, with every head bowed, every eye closed, we're going to pray. And we're going to believe for, for chains to be broken off today. We're going to believe it, church. And just like the faith of the friend brought salvation, the faith of each other right now, I believe that lives are going to be set free. Trajectories are going to change. So, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you do not want us to be stuck in shame. You do not want us stuck in this cycle, Lord God, that only happens in isolation. So, Lord, we speak against the devil because he wants to see us stuck there. He wants to see you stuck in isolation. 
But God wants you in community. He wants light to be shined onto every circumstance in your life so you can be set free. So we pray right now for chains to be broken. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And the second group I want to talk to right now is, is, is the person that feels like they have no relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're in this room because you got invited to Blockbuster Sunday. You heard we are going to be doing Inside Out too. And now you're back here again this week. You're like, I'll check this out. I like Disney. I want to talk to you because, like I said, Jesus is inviting you to the table. So with every eye closed, with every eye closed, if you want to give your life over to Jesus today, and you don't want to be stuck by yourself anymore, you don't want to be stuck, maybe you as well find yourself in that addiction cycle. I want you to have the opportunity right now with every eye closed to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Well, if everyone can repeat after me, let's pray together. It's a salvation prayer. Lord, I thank you that you were thinking of me on the cross. Lord, I pray you would forgive me of my sins. I pray that you would make me new. Lord, I thank you for a new life. I thank you, Lord, that I'm walking out of here new. I thank you that you see me as a son and as a daughter. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.